Okay, so in the next few days, or maybe next few weeks, we're going to be looking at a few sort of very classic, very famous models. So applications of differential equations in applied mathematics. Um, of course, this material has to be accessible on an undergraduate level. So if these models seem a little simplistic, be assured that people have looked at much more complicated versions of these things. We're going to present sort of the basic ideas. And we'll start with the Latka Volterra equation. Which can be used in a lot of situations, but were first studied in the context of a predator prey model. So we've got a predator. species and the number of predators we'll call y of t and we'll have a prey species and the number of prey we'll call x of t. And we're going to try to find a system of differential equations representing this situation. And the system of differential equations, I'll put the first one on the board and then I'll talk about it. Dx dt equals a x minus p times x times y. So let me just briefly scribble that out. So if we just had this, this would represent exponential growth. Um, so our assumption here is that the prey species has unlimited resources. Which, of course, is not true. And one way you could complicate this model is to put in a limiting factor. But um, we'll assume that the prey species has unlimited resources and will grow exponentially, or I should say would grow exponentially, except that they're being preyed upon. And the predator is going to keep the prey species under control. So we'll add another term representing the interactions between the predator and the prey species. So things that look like this, this x times y, these are going to show up a lot in models because when you've got your variables multiplied together, it represents interaction. So these products are going to show up every time you have a process that is fueled by your groups interacting. 
interacting with each other. We are seeing it in the predator-prey model, where we're looking at interactions between the predators and prey. We'll see it in models of diseases, where a disease is spread by interaction between an infective and a susceptible person. We'll see it in models of armed conflict where war casualties are caused by interactions between opposing members of opposing militaries. So here, this XY represents the predator species eating the prey species. And we have a negative sign in front of that term because this interaction is bad for the prey species. It causes the prey population to go down. So our second equation, is going to be dy dt equals, and now it's going to look very similar to the prey species, except that some signs are going to be reversed. We'll have a negative by, we'll have a positive qxy. So again, just looking at the part of this system that I didn't scribble out, this dx dt equals ax is telling us what would happen if we didn't have any interaction between the predator and the prey species. And what's happening is that because the prey species is assumed to have unlimited resources, it would grow exponentially. Yeah. Now this, the part of the system that I didn't scribble out, is represents what would happen to the predator species if they were left alone and didn't interact with the prey species in any way. And you see, this time, that term has a negative number in front of it, because what would happen to the predator species if they didn't interact with the prey species is that they'd go extinct. They need the prey species to survive. So that's why there is a negative sign in front of the B and not instead of the and not in front of the A. Um, once again, we have an interaction term, an XY term. This time the interaction term is positive because interactions between the predator and the prey species are good for the predator species. So this is the Locke Volterra system in its simplest form. It's making a lot of assumptions that might not be true in nature. It's assuming the prey species has unlimited resources. Um, it's assuming that the predator species can survive on nothing but this prey species, which is probably not true in most real world situations. You know, if a pike can't eat 
one type of prey fish, it could still eat another type of prey fish. So it's a simple um, system. But of course, that simplicity also makes it great for undergrad um, differential equations because it's simple enough for us to solve analytically as opposed to just going to a computer and seeing what the computer tells us will happen. We're going to study this equation in terms of its fixed point. So, Um, so we're going to study this fixed point using the Jacobian. And we'll remind ourselves what the Jacobian is. If we have a system, the x dt equals something. dy dt equals something. The Jacobian is the matrix of partial derivatives. And if you ever struggle to remember what goes where in the Jacobian, you can kind of, let me rewrite that a little, you can basically just read it off. The, um, the first equation gives the first row. The second equation gives the second row. The first variable gives the first column. The second variable gives the second. And then we analyze the Jacobian and we'll um we'll talk about that briefly. Um so this is a way of analyzing fixed points. So I uh, put the Jacobian on the board, but maybe I wasn't was going a bit out of order there. Maybe before we worry about the Jacobian, we should make sure that this system has fixed points for us to analyze. Well, on a kind of meta level, I've sort of given away that there are, but that's fine. So remember to find fixed points. Both the derivatives need to be equal to zero. And what we're going to use here is the zero product property. Um, the zero product property says, well, if we're multiplying things together and they equal zero, then one of the things we're multiplying has to equal zero. A very fancy sounding name for a very, um, elementary school concept. So for the first thing, the first equation to be zero, 
there are two ways that that could happen. For the second equation to be a zero, there are two ways that that can happen. So, in all, there are, or it might seem like there are, four ways for both of these equations to be zero. And that would give you four fixed points. Um, in reality, we only have two fixed points because of some redundancies. Um, does this, I mean, does this diagram I've put on the board make sense to you in terms of how we're finding the fixed points? Then this is all perfectly well x equals zero, y equals zero. It makes sense that this is a fixed point. Um, if both the predator and the prey species go extinct, then we're done and, and they just stay extinct. What about x equals zero? And y equals negative b plus qx. Um, well, this is, sorry, not y equals negative b plus qx equals zero. So we're looking at this possibility here. Well, in fact, this possibility can't happen because if x is zero and negative b plus qx equals zero, that tells us that B equals zero. And okay, but, but what is B? B is the starvation rate. Uh, saying that B equals zero is the same as saying that the predator species doesn't need to eat that if the prey species went away, the predator species would still not starve and just go and go along forever. Um, so that doesn't make sense. In fact, maybe I should say this explicitly. The Lakovo-Terra equations are only doing what we want them to do if all of these terms are strictly positive. They're not allowed to be negative. They're not allowed to be a zero. So this can't happen. This, um, this connection doesn't work. The only way for x to be zero and that other term to be a zero is if b equals zero, which can't happen. And now maybe you can, maybe you could guess, but um. 
this connection also doesn't work for the same reason, more or less. If y were going to be zero, and also a minus py was going to be zero, well then a would have to be zero. No good, a has to be positive. That leaves us with only one other connection to try, and this connection works. A minus py equaling zero means that y has to be a divided by p. Negative b plus qx equals zero. implies that x has to be b divided by q. So, the Lotka-Volterra equations have two fixed points. One of them is bad for everybody. Um, the predator and prey species both exist. The other is good for everybody. The predator species and the prey species keep existing. Um, X is, I always forget, X is prey. So in this fixed point, there are B over Q prey animals and A over P predator animals. And the population persists. So maybe we can take um, a pretty good guess as to extinction, or actually maybe we can't. Maybe the behavior of the extinction fixed point is a little unintuitive. And partly that's just down to the simplicity of the model. But we might think that the stability of that extinction fixed point is going to depend on the parameters of the model. Like if the prey, maybe if the predator species just is really eating a lot of the prey species, that causes extinction. Whereas if the predator species just eats one prey animal every week or something, that won't cause extinction. Well, we're not going to see that. And maybe instead of predicting the future and saying what we'll see in the future, I should just go ahead and start doing the problem. So the partial derivative of this first equation with respect to x. So I use the phrase partial derivative, and some of you might have had no idea what I was talking about. Um, it's, a, it's a concept of calculus three, and this class does not have calculus three as a prerequisite. So Sorry to keep starting stuff and stopping. We started talking about the Jacobian, then stopped to find the fixed points, then started talking about the Jacobian again, and now we'll stop again to um, give our crash course on the partial derivatives. 
So partial derivatives occur when you have functions of more than one variable. Um, two variables in this particular setting. And this is not um, obviously not coming from the Locke Volterra equation. It's coming um, from my head. It's just an example I'm going to use to present the concept of the partial derivatives. So you take the partial derivatives with respect to a variable. That's, and to indicate what variable you are taking it with respect to, you put the variable in a subscript next to the x. So in this case, I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to x. And what this means is that we're going to treat x as a variable and all of the other variables we're going to pretend aren't. That is to say, we're going to treat y as a constant. So in this first example, I say we're going to treat y as a constant. It might be helpful just to imagine a specific constant. Like maybe we treat y as if it were the number five. Let me write those in a different order. So the derivative of x squared is what? Uh, 2x. What about the derivative of y squared? So, going with the constant. Because we're treating y as a constant. What's the derivative of a number? Oh, zero. Exactly right. The derivative of xy? Five. Right. Well, um, I would see y. But I mean, you're absolutely right that in this example, it's okay. five, but. In general, it's y. The derivative of the sine of x. Cosine of x. And the derivative of the cosine of y. The so negative sine of y. Be careful. Um, I did not do a good job, so it's my fault that maybe but the cosine of y is a number. We could so think if y were five, for example, we could go to our calculator or, you know, even let me go to, I'll bet Google will do this for us. And type in the cosine of five, and get that it's about 0.284. So up here, what's the derivative of 0 0.284? Zero. Zero. So treating y as a constant, 
the derivative of the cosine of y is zero. And then the partial derivative with respect to y is the reverse of this. We treat y as our variable and treat x as a constant. So what's the derivative of x squared in that setting? Zero. Zero. Derivative of y squared is 2y. The derivative of xy is x because we're treating x as a constant. The sine of x is a constant. Its derivative is zero. But the derivative of the cosine of y is the negative sine of y. So let's do our second example with the partial derivatives, but our second example will be feeding into the problem we're looking at, the Locke volterra equations. So here are the Locke Volterra equations. The Jacobian is a matrix of partial derivatives. So, what's the partial derivative of F with respect to X? So there's the Jacobian. And now we'll remember how the Jacobian works, as it were. Um, the Jacobian is a way of specifying the stability of fixed points. And the Jacobian is based around the idea that we already know how to classify some fixed points. We know how to classify the origin zero when we've got x prime equals a x. Or maybe we haven't quite internalized all that yet, but you look at eigenvalues and eigenvalues, and you know if there's a positive and negative eigenvalue, what's that? Oh, let's see. Um, sorry. No, it, it's fine. <laughs> We're coming off a long weekend. Uh, that's a saddle. That's a saddle, and you know, two positive eigenvalues is an unstable node, and a complex eigenvalue with a negative real part is a asymptotically stable spiral. We did all of that stuff. So, 
the way the Jacobian works, we've got a system. The Jacobian does generalize to higher dimensions, but I'll just assume we're in the plane. So you've got fixed points. And in this case, our fixed point extinction is at the origin, but that will make it sort of hard to see what's going on. We've got a fixed point up in the first quadrant, say. Um, well, to classify this fixed point, we find the Jacobian and then we look at the linear system X prime equals JX, where J is the Jacobian. So this has a fixed point at the origin, and you use the what we did last week to classify this. Maybe you find that there's a positive and a negative eigenvalue. So this thing, this fixed point is a saddle. Then going back to the original system and the original fixed point, the fixed point we actually care about, that fixed point is also a saddle, also unstable as well, of course. So, we find the Jacobian, we classify the origin, we find the stability of the origin, and then the fixed point we use to define that um, Jacobian has the same type and the same um, stability. And there are wrinkles in this. There are situations where it doesn't work. Um, I will just refer you back to the video from Thursday last week for that, but it's going to work fine in the Locke Volterra case. So if we want to know what happens at extinction, for example, at zero comma zero, we plug that into the Jacobian. I haven't used function notation here, but I mean, the Jacobian has an X and a Y value. The Jacobian is a, um, function, essentially, a matrix of functions. So we plug zero comma zero, and what happens? We get A, zero, zero, negative B. We find the eigenvalues if you uh, if anyone's taken linear algebra, they might be able to do this really quickly. 
because this matrix is special, it's diagonal. But if not, it's perfectly fine. We find the characteristic polynomial. We set it equal to zero. And we get a positive eigenvalue and a negative eigenvalue. And a positive and a negative eigenvalue tell us that a fixed point is a saddle and is unstable. And the way to think about unstable fixed points is that there's something we don't see in nature. So in this admittedly In this admittedly simple um, version of a predator prey model, extinction will not occur. Um, that is to say, the you know, it's it's easy to imagine, I think, how extinction could occur, sort of thinking about it. Um, because the predator species needs the prey species to stay alive, but also the predator species is constantly reducing the number of the prey species. But this model says we don't expect predators to drive the prey extinct, which, I mean, makes perfect sense. Right, because I mean, we see in nature predator species and prey species. If the predator species were were routinely driving the prey species extinct and then starving to death themselves, um, well, that's hardly a very um healthy ecosystem. So it makes sense that that's not what happens. What about the other um, fixed point? So this represents coexistence. And the uh, Maybe the naive, I, I don't say that as an insult, I think naive has negative connotations, but it's a word that gets used a lot in mathematics, not intended to be negative. Maybe the naive assumption is that um, this will be asymptotically stable. Because that's what we saw, um, if you can think way back to the beginning of this class, that's what we saw in the um, logistic model. We had an unstable fixed point at extinction, and then an asymptotically stable fixed point where the animal population um, maintains itself. So let's see, B over Q and A over P.
So if we plug this in, this X and this Y in, A minus P times the fraction A over P, negative P times the fraction B over Q, Q times the fraction A over P, and negative B plus Q times the fraction B over Q. So we wind up with zeros on the diagonal. And then these numbers on the anti-diagonal. And because all of the constants in the Voltaire equation are positive, um, these things are what they see. That is to say, this number with a negative sign in front of it is negative. This number without a negative sign in front of it is positive. So, so um, finding the eigenvalues we get negative lambdas alone on the diagonal because there were zero was there and we subtract lambda on the diagonal. Then let's see, QAP and negative PBQ. So lambda squared minus QA over P times P B over Q. And this is supposed to be zero to find the eigenvalues. Uh, cancellation occurs. The Qs go away, the Ps go away. Lambda squared minus A B equals zero, lambda squared equals a, b, wait, something's gone terribly wrong. And what's gone terribly wrong is that I forgot the negative sign in front of that fraction when I was writing it out here. So this is positive, this is negative, that's what I thought should happen. So lambda ends up being complex. And it has a real part of zero. Zero plus or minus the imaginary unit i times the square root of a times b. So, so our fixed point is a neutrally stable center, not asymptotically stable after all. Um, but this makes sense, or I know it can be obnoxious if you're confused and your professors making statements like that. Let's say that I think we can talk it through and make it make sense.
Yes. So here's where we're at. We've got our X species, which is the prey, our Y species, which is the predators. If the prey species weren't there, the predators would be going extinct. If the predator species wasn't there, the prey species would be blowing up to infinity. We've said that this fixed point at the origin is a saddle. That's what we found using the eigenvalues. And that this is what a saddle looks like. Going into the origin on one axis, going away from the origin on the other axis. And then we have a fixed point out here where the predator and the prey species are both constant. And this is neutrally stable. And a neutrally stable fixed point represents closed orbits. So what we are seeing here, imagine we start near this axis. There aren't a lot of um, prey, there are a lot of predators. So the predator population starts to go down. There aren't a lot of prey, so they're starving. Well, as the predator population goes down, the prey species starts to rebound. There aren't a lot of predators preying on them, so the prey species is able to flourish. But why, was, why were the predators decreasing in the first place? Well, they were decreasing because there wasn't enough food, because they were starving. Now there's a lot of food. Now the predator species, now the prey species is flourishing. So the predator species is no longer starving, and it starts to rebound. Well, eventually, the predator species will have rebounded so much, and there will be so many predators, that the prey species will start to decrease for a while. And the, as the prey species is decreasing, the predator species for a while will keep going up. I mean, that's because, how should I put this? That's because the health of the predator species in one generation really depends on the health of the prey species in the previous generation. So for a while, the prey species are going down. The predator species is still increasing. But then the low number of prey starts to catch up with the predators. Now they're starving to death. They're going down. The prey species goes down for a while. But once there are few enough predators, the prey species can rebound, and we just keep tracing out that pattern over and over again. So those are the predictions of the Lotka-Volterra model. And 
this certainly is what we see in a lot of sort of real world situations, more or less. Um, I will say one thing, you know, fixed point analysis is very powerful. I like it a lot. Um, one thing we do lose if we're just doing fixed point analysis is that we don't get any conception of time scales. Like, we're going to go around this orbit over and over again. That's what we predict. But is it going to take us a decade? Is it going to take us five decades? Does it happen? Maybe it happens over the course of months if you have animals with very short gestation periods. Um, and to get information about time scales, you really have to use technology. Um, you can't solve the lock of Volterra equations by hand. Instead, you run computer simulations. So we have a little time left, but not a whole lot. Um, the next application is going to be relatively brief. I think we'll look at we'll look at another um, population model Thursday, and then we'll also look at a totally different model is I think how this is going to end up being. Rather than try to start um, looking at competition with only 10 minutes left.